Thank God. He usually hit Ellie's house and healed her. But I just praise God he was merciful to him. A, mer- a merciful God and a hand of protection. Anybody else? All right, if you'll turn with me to the book of Habakkuk again. We'll go back to Habakkuk chapter 1, verse number 5. We kind of started this Wednesday night last week. I don't know how long we're going to, to stay here, uh, but uh, we're going to continue to talk about outpouring, uh, perhaps for the rest of this year. And I apologize if you came thinking you're going to get a Christmas story because I'm just not in the Christmas story mood. Not that I don't believe in Christmas. I just believe this is, uh, this is what God is speaking and what He's doing uh, in these last days. And I want to be a part of what He's doing. Amen? Praise God. Yeah, we need, need to go ahead and do offering. We can do that and then read. Can we do that? All right. Praise God. Come on. Brother Aleph, would you just ask the Lord's blessing over this offering, please? Father, thank you this evening for your blessing, for this privilege we have to worship you by giving. And I pray your blessings upon each one that gives, and even those who have not to give. Father, may it be for your honor and glory we do this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you give. Absolutely. Amen. Yes. 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 You can be so discouraged by listening to the news and what's going on in our state's economy. And, and I believe you need to say that while well, we live in a land of joys, we live in a land of plentiful. And I think that God is going to make this very plentiful for all of us. Yes. And, and He's our source. Amen. And to have the faith there to take care of us. And I just praise Him. Praise the Lord. Praise God. All right. Habakkuk 1, verse number 5. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. Father, I thank you for your word and your people. I submit myself to the authority of your word and the leadership of your spirit. Lord, I pray that you will give me a fresh anointing for this word tonight, that I might deliver it with clarity and conviction, Lord, that we would hear and receive this word and do what you uh, inspire us through your word to do. Father, I pray right now blessings upon the hearers of this word tonight, and I believe that we're going to be radically changed because of what we hear. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. Outpouring part two. I believe what we are entering a phase, a specific period of time in, in the history of mankind where we can boldly declare that we are going to experience and are experiencing an epic outpouring. 
I uh, uh, submit to you today that, that this outpouring will both surpass and will fulfill all previous outpourings that the world has ever known. Let me remind you that last week or last Wednesday we talked about and, and pointed out very clearly from Scripture that God is both doing uh, and going to bring great judgment upon the earth, but at the same time, He will bring great revival in the last day. And we, uh, there's no stopping either of the movements because they are both part of God's plan, but the good news is that we can choose which side of biblical prophecy we want to be engaged in at the coming of the Lord. I don't know about you, but if God is bringing calamity and God is bringing revival together, simultaneously at the end of this age I want to be on the part of revival amen and I believe that's where God's people need to be and should be and I believe that we are in an epic outpouring of God's presence in the earth today uh, that will bring not only revival but transformation and I believe that we need transformation revivals come and go but transformation lasts for longer periods than the traditional revival and I'm believing God for a transformation within me within us within southern West Virginia within our economy within things that's happening politically and socially and economically and spiritually I'm believing for a transformation that that moves the church forward in these last days amen Ecclesiastes 1 and 9 says the thing that hath been it is that which shall be and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. And even though I believe and am convinced that we are in the midst of an epic outpouring of God's presence in the earth, it's not new to God. Amen. It does not take Him by surprise. It's part of His prophetic plan. And part of his redemptive plan for the world and for mankind. If we go back to Habakkuk and look from the New King James Version. The same text reads like this. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded for I will work a work in your days. Which you would not believe though it were told you. If we look at Acts chapter 13, verse number 41, the Apostle Paul declared this, Behold, ye despisers, marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you will, which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. Amen. The Apostle Paul was actually rehearsing Habakkuk 1 and 5 into the ears and into the heart and lives of those religious people who would not believe nor embrace salvation by grace through Jesus Christ. Because it was something new that was emerging and had emerged on the scene and the traditional church, the Jewish people, would not embrace it. Now there's a lot to discover and ponder about outpourings. But I believe that we are in the midst of an outpouring that will continue to get stronger and more real in the last days. I say it's epic. Epic means it's the beginning of a new and important period in the history of something. The move of God is not something new. It may be new to a few people. It might be new to a, a, a geographical area. But God's always been moving and He continues to move. But I believe His moving in these last days is going to be so phenomenal and so progressive that even scoffers and even atheists and non-believers will have to acknowledge this is God. Even the church steeped in her own traditions will have to back up and bow down and say this is greater than anything we've ever seen or experienced in the past. I don't know about you. I want to be a part of that. I don't want to be on the sidelines watching that. I don't want to be uh, uh, in the middle of the road trying to stop that locomotive. I want to be on that thing. 
I'm convinced that we're entering into a period of revival that's going to bring us closer to the complete fulfillment of God's redemptive plan of His creation. And of course, even among the church and even among believers, there are going to be doubters. When the New Testament church was birthed on the day of Pentecost, and believers were filled with the Spirit and began to preach under an anointing that had never existed prior to that moment, And even those like the Apostle Paul, Saul, who was out to destroy and to squelch that epic movement, to squelch that epic outpouring, found himself unable to stop it. Not only unable to stop it, but it actually captivated him and radically changed him. I'm here today to tell you that there are people even in the church today that would like to stop an epic outpouring of God's blessings even today. But I'm here to tell you it will not stop we need to get on board with it. Amen. Because there's no stopping God's redemptive plan. I want to be a part of it. When God does a new thing, it is most often the religious people that rejects it first. But that never has stopped God before. There was an epic outpouring. I believe that it is one of progression. It supersedes all previous outpourings. Now there's been a lot of outpourings. In the history of mankind, if we look at them collectively, we can see how God has always been moving. As I preached to you last week, God is moving. He's not, he's not docile. He's not passive. He's always moving through things and through circumstances and through processes to accomplish His perfect will. He's never caught off guard. But I believe what is happening now and what we are on the brink of seeing will complete the cycle of God's redemptive plan. And I believe we're seeing the first fruits of the last epic outpouring on God's timetable. And you say, well, what's all that mean? Well, let's look at history. The history of the church and the history of Scripture will tell us that approximately every 500 years, there seems to be an epic outpouring. The first beginning with Abraham 4,000 years ago. 2000 B.C. 500 years later, we, first of all, we had the Abrahamic covenant 4,000 years ago. 500 years later, we have a Mosaic covenant. We see Moses and the Exodus approximately 500 years after that. Another epic movement of God. 500 years later from that, we find the Davidic covenant. 500 years later, we find a post-exilic Jewish restoration. They're out of exile. 500 years later, we have the coming of Jesus Christ, of which we celebrate on December 25th. But in reality, we ought to celebrate it every day that Christ has come, and He is now with us, though He he physically is at the right hand of the Father through the Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit, He is with us even now. The incarnate Christ came as part of an epic outpouring. 500 years later, we find the church institutionalized. The church of Rome, Constantine, Everybody in the whole known world was Christian. 500 years from that, we find the division of East and West of Christianity. Then in 1500 A.D., approximately, we had the Protestant Reformation. The 95 Thesis nailed to the door. 
And now 500 years later, we are in a current outpouring that we cannot yet quite define. I believe there's significance to these. The 500 years since the Protestant Reformation is characterized by specific renewal and revival periods that we've all talked about, we've all learned through, our, through, through history. Beginning with the 16th and 17th century when, when the Reformation came, it was all about justification. Then in the 1700s there was a revival of the Wesleyans that brought about Regeneration, the 19th century sanctification, 20th century, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and revitalization. And I believe that this last outpouring will be characterized by God's glory and His presence that will bring about transformation. Can somebody say praise the Lord? There's a progressive movement of God, an outpouring of God. And in these last 500 years, we have seen revival, cycles of revival that have swept through lands and swept through continents and swept through countries. But I believe that we're about to see a culmination of all of that that's going to bring about a transformation where the glory of God fills the entire earth. So how are we going to figure that out? That's all history. But if we look at the Old Testament tabernacle, we can be reminded that God's intention has always been to dwell in the midst of a redeemed people. To display His glory and to be worshipped forever. It's always been God's desire and God's intent to dwell with mankind. That's why He created Adam and put him in the perfection of a garden. That's why He gave him a helpmate, a wife by the name of Eve. And He walked with them in the cool of the day. He had communion with them. But because of the fall that was separated and annihilated from uh, forever until the coming of Jesus Christ. If we look at that tabernacle, we find a prophetic picture of both what heavenly worship is like as well as the redemptive story of the earth. Do you realize that it, the furnishings of the tabernacle were arranged in such a way that it depicts the cross? In the outer court, the brazen altar. Straight ahead of that, the laver. Inside the gate of the holy place. On the left is the lamp. On the right, the table of showbread. The arms of the cross. Directly in front of that, the altar of incense. And then behind the veil, the Ark of the Covenant. And the mercy seat. Where the presence of God's glory was always manifest. It's a picture of the cross. But it's also a picture of the redemptive process. Of all of these epics outpourings that God has been, been, been displaying in the earth. From, from, from Abraham even until now. It's a picture of that Old Testament tabernacle. Well, how, how can you prove that, preacher? Well, let's look at the brazen altar. The brazen altar was about the sacrifice. It was about the shedding of the blood. It was about justification by faith in the finished work of Christ Jesus. It was no longer about an institutional church. And when the Reformation came and broke away from the traditional Catholic church and the Roman Catholic church and the politicized church, it came back to the altar, putting the altar in the church and believing in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and not the, the commendation of a church or a hierarchy or an institution, but it was coming back to the blood and being justified through Jesus Christ. 
I reject and refuse to embrace anything that denies or tries to diminish the blood of Jesus. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care how many blessings have been prayed over you. I don't care how many things you wear around your neck or put on your wall or put on your bumper sticker or wear on your lapel. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no remission of sins. There's no salvation. Except through Jesus Christ. So that brazen altar really shows the epic outpouring of the Reformation. Bringing us full circle and back to the blood of Jesus. From there we go to the labor, which was the ceremonial cleansing of the priest. Who after dealing with the, the, the sacrifice of the animal and the spilling of the blood and the burning of the sacrifice. Then before they would go into the holy place, they would ceremonial cleanse themselves and wash themselves at the laver. A beautiful picture of regeneration. Showing exactly what the 18th century in our history has shown us. The evangelical revival of the 1800s, the Wesleyan revival. Declaring that experiential salvation is not just something that, that, that is done ceremonially, but you can really have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can have a born again experience, be regenerated, being born again. Thanks be to God for the, re, for the revival of the 1700s. I'm glad to know that you can be born again through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so many people today have a religious experience or they have an emotional experience and they come to altars and they shed some tears and they apologize for the wrongs that they've done but they never repented and God never calls us to apologize for our sins but to repent and turn from them. We go from the laver into the holy place and on the left hand the lamp stands. Seven oil lamps. Burning day and night the light of the Holy Spirit. Signifying the presence of God in the midst of His people. It really shows a picture of the fruits of the Spirit. But on the right the table of showbread. And for Israel that represented... Their fellowship with God. Made possible by the Holy Spirit. It corresponds to the emphasis of the gifts of the Spirit. Not the fruits, but the gifts of the Spirit. It shows the koinonia, the, the community between, with God and man. Made possible by the Holy Spirit. That He, His my spirit bears witness because I have the same spirit that we are the sons of God. We dwell together in unity through the fellowship of the indwelling presence of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. It's a beautiful picture of 19th century sanctification. The 20th century, the altar of incense representing the prayers of the people before God. That sweet smell, that aroma that came up. Israel's worship and prayers coming up before the Lord. It really depicts the revival of a spirit-filled worship that has characterized the last two decades of the 20th century. A renewal of spirit-filled worship in all churches. Not just Pentecostal churches. I'm finding as I, as I meet more and more people in other, uh, other churches and other denominations that are not normally characterized by spirit-filled worship, it is one thing that they are hungry for. It's one thing they are longing for. They don't know that much about it. But they understand there's a new dimension. There's a new outpouring. There's an epic movement of God. They can't quite grasp it. They haven't been taught it. They haven't been experienced it. But they're hungry for it. 
And in the last furnishing that you see on the inside of the Holy of Holies, beyond the veil, is the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, where the presence of God's glory is experienced, is made manifest. It is symbolic of an epic outpouring. It's going to bring us closer to the complete plan of God's redemptive process. Habakkuk 2.14 says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Do you realize that this outpouring, this last epic outpouring in which we are a part of now is to usher in more and a greater dimension of the presence of God. Hallelujah. I want the earth to be filled with His glory. That's why transformation is so important. That we begin to claim and take back and become better stewards of this earth and all that God has put here. I believe that's why God is strategically placing us together and making us feel this sensitivity because in this nation, what other state, what other geographic location has the resources to power and to fund the needs of this great nation but West Virginia? That's why he's stirring the Baptists. That's why he's stirring the Pentecostals. That's why he's stirring the uh, uh, the, the Methodists and the Episcopals. That's why he's stirring even Roman Catholics because they're there's an epic outpouring that's going to usher in His presence in these last days. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. These, this outpouring, we've already begun to see the first fruits of this epic outpouring. If you have seen the transformational videos, Alamanga, Guatemala, where the earth is radically transformed by a move of God. Glory to God. And we, we, we lulled ourselves into this, this spiritual misnomer that revival is about a, a, a group of, or a church that gets excited and sings some happy songs and a few people get saved. But I'm telling you, this revival is going to be more about an outpouring and a reclaiming this earth and all the fullness thereof. It all belongs to Him. Amen. Alamanga, Guatemala. Revival came and outpouring came and it did produce revival. 20,000 or so were saved. They had four jails and prisons in, in, in that area and they closed down. They closed down and opened the, and used the buildings to have church in because they didn't have nobody to put in jail. Amazing. You think that's fiction? That's a reality of what God is doing. We're seeing more and more of that. I believe we're seeing the roots of that now in this region of the, of the country. For those of you that have already been to Kentucky, you know what I'm talking about. You know what he's birthed here. You know what he's doing here. The fact that these 13 individuals who are all about transformation have signed on and and agreed within 24 hours, I'll be there. I'll change my schedule. I want to be at that transformational summit because I know that God is doing something phenomenal and I want to be a part of it. Mm -mm -mm. I was reading today and and I can't even remember where it was that in another, in another similar case of transformation. 
where the police department had to shut down and the police department, the officers formed a choir to go sing in churches because they didn't have nobody to arrest. I want to see that kind of transformation. I'm tired of, a, of, a, of a, putting a banner up all across the road that says revival and in five days we're all back to the same way we've always been and always lived. I want to see a revival that transforms the earth and trans, transforms the landscape of our culture. When I saw with my own eyes on that video... The phenomenal redemptive process of God over the land. That in Guatemala, no special place, they'd been farming for years. But all of a sudden, when this transformation began to occur, carrots were growing that were as big around as this thing. It was unbelievable to see a cabbage head that a man could barely carry. That's what it's going to look like in the new heaven and the new earth. So we ought to begin the process with this epic outpouring of God and preparing the land for the coming of the glory of the Lord. Everything in that tabernacle was to prepare the people for the, uh, for, for the absolute presence of God in the Holy of Holies. It was a progressive thing that looked like a cross. But it always brought mankind into a face-to-face -face confrontation with the glory of the Lord. Mm -mm -mm. I believe that's what this outpouring is about. It's not about, you know, finding some, uh, some new fast songs to sing. It's, it, it's not about some new revivalist kind of movement. It's about being in tune with God's redemptive plan and realizing that before the, before the incarnation of Christ, there was four specific, you can find them in Scripture, 500-year periods that brought in and ushered in the incarnation of Christ Jesus. And now we're in the fourth one since the incarnation of Christ Jesus. And guess what it's going to usher in? The second coming of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's a repetitive process and it's going to culminate in this last day outpouring called transformation and I want to be a part of it. I'm not looking for another Messiah in a manger. I'm looking for the Messiah to come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And He will set up His eternal kingdom. And this outpouring is to prepare the bride, the New Testament, the New Covenant people, it's to prepare her just like the tabernacle was to prepare the Jew under the Jewish covenant. The people to go behind the veil into the glory of the Lord. Mm -mm -mm. We've characterized and thought with our own mind and, and our own teaching and our own tradition that revival is a few days of, of, of hyper-spirituality. And we come down and come out of it and then find an even kill and go on. But this transformation is the last thing that I believe God will do before the reincarnation. Not that I believe in reincarnation, but for the, the coming of the Lord. Because Jesus is coming again. And the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We can see from an historical record what God has been doing in all of these movements and in the four revival periods of the last 500 years. You don't have to go to the Bible. Go to the history book. You can, you can find it. It's, the evidence is clear. 
But instead of looking back through history, let's look forward through Revelation to understand what this is all about. And why God has strategically placed us in this place for this purpose and for this period of time. For a revival of transformation. But I know, because I'm human too, that it's far easier to have faith that looks back and sees where the church has been than to have faith to look ahead to see where she's headed. Because the veil has been rent. And the next step beyond the altar of incense, the next step beyond the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that was revitalized in this 20th century, in the early 1900s, was to step behind and beyond the veil into the fullness of the outpouring of God's presence. God is still speaking, church. He's still saying, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? Will you not recognize it? Will we be guilty as those in Paul's days who said, I'm not sure about this new thing. It goes against our tradition. You've come to pervert our tradition is what they, what they accused the people of God of. And Paul stands and declares Habakkuk 1 and 5. There's no stopping this locomotive, church. The world is on a journey to a redemptive process that's orchestrated and masterminded by God, the creator of all things. And it's about to culminate into completeness. I don't know about you, but I sense an increase of Holy Ghost activity in the ministry in the earth, not just here. Everywhere I go and people that I talk to, there's a stirring. No one can put their finger on it. No one can, can map it out. But we know from the biblical record and the biblical types and shadow what is ahead. Psalm 57 and 5 says, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be above all the earth. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be above all the earth. You see, this whole process over the past 500 years, though the church was birthed in power and authority on the day of Pentecost, in 500 years she had become so institutionalized, so politicized, that if she didn't condone it, meaning the church organization, then it wasn't so. It moved far away from what thus saith the Lord than to what thus saith the church. But in the last... 400 years. There's been a shift from the glory of the church and God's not going to share His glory with any man to usher in through great epic outpourings the presence of the glory of the Lord. That will surpass any earthly organization, any political power, any military force. The glory of the Lord will be above the earth. And the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I believe that we are strategically placed in a place where there are so many resources yet untapped to fuel this country and this nation and perhaps even the world 
while the com coming of God's judgment, which is sure, there's no stopping that either, will come from beneath our feet. God wants to bring transformation. And church, you need to get a hold of this. You really need to get a hold of this. Because I believe God is sending sons and daughters back to West Virginia to be the force that both stewards, the resources needed to fund, to, to move and to power this last day revival. This last day outpouring that's going to fill the earth with His glory. Father, I thank You for Your people. And I thank You, Lord, for their attentiveness to what's been spoken here tonight. I pray, God, that You will help us to discern. Give us wisdom and understanding into the things that you are doing in these last days. Lord, let us not be reactive to what the world says, but let us be proactive according to what your word says. Lord, I pray that you will awaken us as a church body. Here in one of the most coal-rich counties in all of this state. God, help us to be wise stewards of what you want to do. Lord, don't let us be like the five foolish virgins, but may we be ready. Our lamps filled, trimmed, and burning. Awaiting for the coming of the bridegroom. Lord, I pray that every heart and every life and every home and every individual will be stirred. Stirred to the depths of their soul, Lord. I rebuke a spirit of complacency and lethargy that has gripped the Western church. God, may we awaken.